Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming back for the fourth part of Houses for the Dead. I forgot where I was at for a second. We'll start off where we left off. The next to the last day of his visit, Timothy went with his grandmother to Clara's. Clara cut his grandmother's hair, and the shop smelled of blue chemicals. A row of hair dryers sat against the wall. They sat down on top of the old ladies' heads, and Timothy sat at the front table looking through old copies of Red Book in Good Housekeeping. On one page, a woman and a man and two boys all sat down together at a table. They were all staring at the big brown chicken in the middle of the page and smiling like it was the best thing they'd ever seen. They each wore clean, pressed shirts, and Timothy knew they'd never be alone, not even for a moment, and they'd never have to see a boy in a coffin or go home to a room they disliked or be forced to meet Tracy, their father's girlfriend, in a park on a cold day wearing a jacket that wasn't warm enough. Tracy had been shivering, too, and his father made it seem like they were meeting there by accident. She reached out her hand for Timothy, who was surprised by its cool dryness. He did not tell her that he saw her in the mall. She smiled a nice smile with big white teeth, and then they all stood there in silence until Timothy's father took them to get something to eat. Timothy hadn't understood why they hadn't met at the restaurant. Timothy's mother was already looking for houses then. His father was staying in the Comfort Inn for a few weeks, and Timothy liked the hotel. The beds were made tight, sheets stretched like plastic wrap over the mattresses. When he stayed with his father, he'd slip down between the sheets without disturbing the sides, so that the pressure of the covers, their tautness, kept him still. None of the people in the magazine photo would ever miss anyone. At first, their smiles seemed fake. The boys didn't look at all alike. But the more he stared, the more happy they seemed, and the more real. He looked to his grandmother, but she and her friend Maeve were talking, or at least their lips were moving. The hair dryers were so loud he couldn't hear any actual words. How could anyone be so happy, he asked, holding up the magazine. No one turned. The genuine happiness aggravated him. There was too much to be unhappy about. Ask the straw man with his dusty clothes and endless appetites and wanderings. Ask him about happy. Timothy wanted to smack each person in the picture, and even imagining such a thing surprised him. He'd wanted to smack a boy in school for wrecking his art project, but he'd not done so and he once wanted to smack a girl on the bus for calling him a turd, but he restrained himself. But imagining slapping, this happy group fostered a lovely warmth in his chest, and he was sure that if he was with them, he would have done so. He studied the small details of the photo, the butter dish, and the carpet pattern, and the light switches, and the sideboard covered with plates, and the doorway beyond which the kitchen glowed a muted yellow. In one corner of the kitchen, near a cabinet, a tiny portion of the countertop was visible. Timothy was surprised to see a hand next to the toaster. It was reaching out from the non-visible part of the room, but it was easy to imagine the wrist and the arm and the shoulder and the body of this floating hand. None of the family seemed aware of the hand or aware of anyone else in the house. They seemed suddenly stupid, grinning foolishly at their food instead of paying attention to who was lurking in the kitchen, and Timothy no longer wanted to smack them. His frustration swam away, and he wanted to warn them. He felt sorry for what was about to happen. The placement of the food and their serious contemplation of their evening meal seemed pitiful. How could they not know something bad was coming? How could they not see? On the next page, the family relaxed in the living room, father and mother in reclining chairs, the two boys on the couch. The hand was there, too, fingers curling around the corner where the hallway started. 
Opposite the hand was a mirror, and in the mirror was a dark shadow, a thin body in dark clothes, face blurry yet menacing. And in all the successive seven pages of photos, Timothy found the hand, or the reflection, or the body. What stupid people, so unaware. He closed the magazine and stared out the front window. Across the street, two men were arguing. They were gesturing and pointing their fingers at each other, and then another man walked by and made a strange face at both of them, and all three of them burst out laughing. When the third man left, the two arguers talked more calmly for a moment, one of them shaking his head and the other waving his hand back and forth. After a few more moments, they shook hands and parted company. His grandmother came behind Timothy and gave him a lollipop and tugged on his shoulder. Her hair was curled and blue, and she looked old and comfortable. They walked down to the car and then drove to the store and bought seven cases of pop and two cases of crackers and a big wheel of cheese, and then they went to St. Paul's, and instead of going upstairs like, like they did on Sundays, they parked near the back entrance. Three men came up to the car and carried the food into the basement. Timothy's grandmother took his hand and led him downstairs into the function hall, where a lot of old ladies in dresses were putting together plates of food and tying rice into small bags and blowing up balloons with a big tank of gas. His grandmother paraded him through the room, and all of the ladies leaned down to him and smiled and crinkled their faces and kissed his cheeks, and when they came through the swinging doors into the kitchen, she let Timothy stand on a stool while she took a big cutting board from a shelf and unwrapped the wheel of cheese and cut it into small cubes. She showed him how to put a toothpick into each one, and soon they had two large platters filled with cheese. They unpacked the cases of crackers and opened each box and fanned them onto still other platters and covered everything with plastic wrap. Other women were in the kitchen, too, and steam was rising from the chafing dishes, and men were coming to take the dishes into the front room. They left by the side door, and his grandmother paused to talk to some people in another room. Timothy peeked around his grandmother and saw a woman sitting on a folding chair in a wedding dress. Another woman was holding the sitting woman's hair and spraying hairspray in wide loops. Even more women sat at a long table looking into mirrors and putting on lipstick and pursing their lips and dabbing their cheeks with little sponges. All of their dresses were the color of straw. Outside, the church bells were ringing and people were coming through the parking lot wearing suits. The men wore dark suits, and Timothy wondered if any of them had worn the same clothes last night in the house upon the hill. Thinking of the boy in the coffin made Timothy remember the family in the magazine. He'd wanted to show his grandmother the hand and the shadow, but it was in the opposite direction, and talking to adults seemed to have a little effect. The man in the photo couldn't have been a good man. He was certainly hiding on purpose. But who was he, Timothy, to say anything? How many hands and shadows had he himself missed? Perhaps there was always someone just around the corner. He'd felt that before, walked into a room that seemed to have just emptied. Perhaps there were dozens of people in every house, all the people from before, all the people mostly in better places. Maybe they all left behind hands or shadows or whole bodies. The more he thought about the shadow, the less sinister it seemed. If it had wanted to harass the family... It could have walked in and done so at any time. There was no need to lurk. It made more sense to assume the shadow longed to be with the family, or was the remains of whatever gets left behind when the rest of the body goes off. Perhaps the family was in the better place, and the shadow simply wanted to join them, but couldn't find his way. Perhaps he was shy. Perhaps the hand in the kitchen was simply reaching for a glass of water. Perhaps he was hungry. Thank you. More tomorrow.